First, I want to walk our way by way of getting the argument from chapter nine. I want to walk our way through that uh, prolific use of scripture that Paul makes in this passage. And he's got creative readings, right? If anybody, uh, any among you have a standard ready definition of exegesis, throw it in the chat and I'll, I'll turn on the chat for myself. Um, throw it in the chat. Exegesis, as I define it, is understanding the text on the basis of the text and leading out from it what it has, what it what is in it. Asegesis, it brings together a different Greek preposition with uh, sort of pulling out. Asegesis takes things that are alien to the text and moves them in for whatever reason, right? Yeah, I had a, my good friend, David Bartlett, is a New Testament or was a New Testament exegete, uh, David of, of blessed memory, was a New Testament PhD and a New Testament exegete. But every once in a while, when he heard somebody say something that he knew wasn't in the text, but he also liked, he would say, that'll preach, by which he was coding to, to me or others around. It's not exactly what the text says, but it's true, right? So it, I, I could preach it, but I couldn't put it in a paper, right? The asegesis is taking meanings into a text and lodging them there from outside the text. Another way of thinking of it is exegesis is what it meant then. And hermeneutics, another word, interpretation, is what it might mean now. Exegesis is understanding what the text would have meant to author and audience at the time. Ace, um, uh, hermeneutics is what it, what might it mean now, or what is the impact of it in our time, or how do we see it now? All right. So Paul uses a lot of scripture here. Let's start with nine three, because uh, I'll read out the first verses of chapter nine from uh, from the Revised Standard Version. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen by race. They're Israelites. And to them belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And of their race, according to flesh, is the Messiah. God, who is over all, be blessed forever. Now, he does not cite scripture there. But I want you to look at this first verse that I have on your screen. Because in 9.3, when he says, and I'll read it out in his words again, I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Messiah for the sake of my brethren, my uh, my kinsman by race. There is a subliminal parallel being drawn here between Paul and Moses. Because look what Moses said, and uh, I'll I'll tell you what he said, and then I'll back up into the context. But now, if you will only forgive their sin, namely Israel's, Moses said. But if not, please blot me out of the book that you have written. Anybody know the setting? This is just after the golden cow has been made. The golden calf has been built. So Moses is up getting commandments that include, you shall have no other gods before me, no graven images and all that. And he comes down the mountain and there's this golden calf that they've made so they can worship it, right? God is ready to blow them away. Moses bargains for Israel and says, Spare them, spare them, God. Remember your promises, all these things. And God sort of slows down and, and uh, Moses says, okay, uh, I hope you forgive their sin, but now if you will only, if, um, if not, please blot me out of the book that, you're, that you have written. Do you see how Paul might see himself in the same role here? He is grieving for and even offering his soul for the sake of his kinspeople's souls 
in this sort of beginning to the to the passage. Right. Some people, of course, read this and hear uh, fakery or or posturing. I happen to give him a, the benefit of doubt and think that he does have Israel on his mind a whole lot of the time as he does his mission to Gentile. He he can't fathom why more Jews have not embraced Jesus as Messiah. Right here, he's willing to trade. Keep them, curse me, right? eliminate me. So if that's the way it begins in one through five, um, I want then to take a look at the next paragraph that goes through uh, and gets us to 14 and uh, nine, 13 and 14, but they're kind of quoting two different passages. Let's see, sorry wrong page. So in 9, 6, Paul says, it's not as though the word of God had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they're Abraham's descendants. But, and here we get a scripture quote, through Isaac shall your descendants be named. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned as descendants. Do you see where we are so far? Abraham and Sarah waited a long time, long time, long time, no pregnancy. So finally they said, let's have you sleep with Hagar. Uh, Sarah suggests it. Um, you sleep with Hagar and we'll get a child of this promise. And of course, Ishmael comes right away. But then... Isaac is born. It causes all kinds of strife in the household. But the question is, which one will be the heir of the promise that God made to Abraham? What Paul is saying here is God started out this pattern of actually making choices. And in this case, Isaac was the child of the promise and Ishmael was, was uh, set aside, right? For and uh, this means that it's not children of the flesh who are the children of God, verse 8, but the children of the promise are reckoned as descendants. For this is what the promise said. About this time I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, here he says, okay, I can hear some of you saying, well, of course, Isaac was Abraham's child, but also Sarah's child. And this is obviously the one that God had promised before, because Ishmael is the, the child of another woman in a way, right? So Paul may be hearing that in his, in his audience or in his own inner voice talking back. Uh, think about Rebecca. Says, when she had conceived by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had nothing either good or bad, in order, had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, Rebecca was told the elder will serve the younger, as it is written, and this is from uh, Malachi, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So the point of the paragraph is God has made choices before. Not everybody who's Israel or not everybody who's in the picture is sort of the true focus of the picture. Starts with... Uh, starts with Ishmael and Isaac and goes to Jacob and Esau, where the younger is against the sort of uh, laws of land and things like that, against custom. The younger is the blessed one. We won't go into how he got that uh, by duping Esau, but even before all that, God said the elder should serve the, serve the younger. Right. The Malachi passage is the one Paul uses, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. Let's go, let's look at that for a second. What shall we say then? Is there injustice in God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I've got a 13 there, it should be 15. 
So it depends upon man's will or ex- not upon man's will or exertion, but upon God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then God has mercy upon whomever God wills and hardens the heart of whomever God wills. How many of you are having a lot of fun listening to this? Right? Okay, Calvinists of America arise. Um, this, this is, this is um, God destiny, right? This is God establishing the destiny. And even Pharaoh is brought into play because there's that famous passage where in the book of Exodus, in chapter 9, verses 15 to 16, The book says, God said to Pharaoh, indeed, by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But this is why I've let you live, to show you my power and to make my name resound through all the earth. So here, that famous line, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, has a purpose. God left Pharaoh in his resistance because God wanted to show God's power to the nations. 